to Byron Katie. <coughs> she has a lit universal beliefs. It's online. It's it's a list of beliefs, and I find that when I have an upset in my life, I go back to that that list of beliefs, and it's like, oh yeah, I see. I'm feeling rejected, or I'm I'm feeling like things must be this way or must be that way. But the one that I keep coming back to recently is, it's possible to make a mistake. And so it's like, I really want to, <laughs> I really want to look at that. That, you know, even our education system, everything we've been taught is that there are mistakes and you correct them. So that's what I would put out there as, as a theme for me recently, is that it's possible to make a mistake. Okay, that's a good inlet for us to start off with. That's a good leading off. <laughs> <laughs> well, from what I was just describing about complicated decision making, choiceless awareness, and then abstraction. Um, we would say that there's no mistakes in, in oneness, and there's no mistake in choiceless awareness. Okay. So it has to be something prior to in awareness, um, to choiceless awareness. So what it really boils down to, and that's really what also the book is about, is, is this tracing back to this conviction that mistakes are in form. Uh, it's, the ego has made up an unreal world, a world of projection, and it's associated this mistake idea, this error, with forms. So behaviors are mistakes. You can make you know, mistakes of behavior, different kinds of actions. Um, some people might say, well maybe there's mistaken thinking. That's a little closer to the release point for the choiceless awareness when you start to see that that a mistake is a we'll call it a misperception. It's a it's a faulty formulation of reality. It's a it's a distortion of reality. Not an action at all, not a behavior. And yet the ego has associated the mistakes and the errors with the behavior to keep guilt in place. I did this wrong, I did that wrong. As you go along you start to see the experience of being a human being comes along with what Jesus says, everyone who comes here keeps a list, counts the goods, the good and the bad, believing that in the end there will be some consequences. So you hope that you have more good <laughs> than bad. You know, they've talked about when you go to the pearly gates, and you try to get entrance. If every human being is hoping that the good list is better than the bad list, bigger than the bad list. Oscar and I have a, a little bit of a similar way of looking at that. We'll do something, then we'll think, oh, that's going to really suck on the life review. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we think we worry about, like our life review. Oh, I don't want to see this one come back again in the life review. We have a life review yeah. jar for you. <laughs> There it is, it's in our culture. It's, it's, right. it's right in the, the program song. is a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or some of you may have, might have seen the, the old classic Albert Brooks movie, Defending Your Life, mm -hmm. where he's got to go to Judgment City, <laughs> and then they actually do review scenes um, and say, what were you feeling there? In other words, to see if he's grown enough to move on <laughs> to the next level of undoing, you know, the skill and judgment. So, the thing about it is, that's what's a good thing about this book, it keeps bringing it back to the choice that you make, the decisions that you make, are really decisions of purpose. They, they seem to be decisions of do this, do that, and decisions of behaviors and actions. Even about divorcing, marrying somebody, who do I date, what job do I take, do I stay or do I leave? You know, whether it's in a job, a relationship, whatever. Those seem to be major decisions on planet Earth. 
And they aren't. They're just projections of purpose. There's a choice for heaven and there's a choice for hell. There's a choice for spirit, there's a choice for ego. There's a choice we could call a wrong-minded decision, and there's a right-minded decision. And so you see, this is where the mind training is coming in. This is where the unwinding is coming in. Unwinding from the idea of personal choices and personal consequences to I have a choice in the way that I look at the world. I have a choice in the way, and really, who am I looking with? Am I looking with the Holy Spirit, or am I looking with the ego? There's a major difference between those choices, to look with the Holy Spirit or to look with the ego. That split in the mind is projected to form, and then it's projected to persons. It's projected to the dream figures as if they've got really weighty decisions to make. From the larger perspective, the script is written, and those choices that seem to be so crucial and so important in form are not what they seem to be at all. They're projections of a choice in purpose, which the mind doesn't want to face. You know, it's too afraid of even going back to that decision point between love and fear, and it, it would rather be, it be mitigated in time and space in little, teeny, meaningless choices that really don't have any consequence at all. And, and the deeper you go in towards this awakening, towards unplugging, you know, that's what they tell Neo at the beginning. Uh, Morpheus said, even before he gets to see Morpheus, he, he has the, the friend that knocks at his door, and the woman's with him, de jour, and she's got the white rabbit, and he says, <clears throat> Buddy, it looks like you need to be unplugged. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're talking about. Unplugging from this twisted belief that the decisions in form are important. Now, what we're going to do is, is work at going from this belief that decisions in form are important to what Frances was just talking about in her introduction, which is and the involuntary nature of miracles. Miracles, Jesus says, are involuntary. They should not be under conscious control. He's teaching us, if we allow miracles to come through us, that is going to be the way out from this conundrum of the stakes, of the belief that we've made lots of mistakes, or maybe even the belief that we continue to make mistakes on the timeline. It's the same thing. Or even the fear and worry about making future mistakes, like when you take a driving test, or when you uh, are reading letters and numbers on an eye exam, and you know that getting your driver's license <laughs> depends on, on saying mostly the right, the right letters and numbers, uh, passing the test. There could be some nervousness, some apprehension, some anxiety, some pressure, but still that's the same thing. Maybe you can just share a bit how, how this involuntary experience has, has changed your experience of yourself and the whole world. Mm. I think for me, um, as long as I believe I have a choice, personal choice, there is always guilt. Always. The, even I think I made, I made a good choice, or there's some good consequence, there's still this heavy fear or guilt underneath it, and then fear of losing it, fear of, you know, can't do it again, you know, it was just everything that associated with this false identity that, that, that doesn't exist always bring guilt and fear. So really, you know, if my experience, if I don't believe truly in experience, experiential level, I don't have any choice, then there is no guilt. There is no guilt, and but from from my own experience, from my own experience, from this step, that this firm belief of everything is perceived from the personal perspective, and every decision is, you know, made by myself, to this complete involuntary experience. Following the Holy Spirit guidance is the big stepping stone 
is where it leads to that experience. You know, like to just, I guess for myself practically, it was through a lot of relinquish of the decision making and just willingly pray to the spirit to, you know, guide me and then really follow whatever that comes my way that is an obvious sign or doesn't really matter whether it can gain me anything and that is another part of the big thing that the self that is not there needs to exist through you know decision making to reinform that is its own existence and also through accumulating getting something whether it benefits me and the wrong decision making is I, I lose something it's just like going this way or that way you know there is no peace in that but just through following the spirit gradually what is lost is this always this this continuous wish to gain something to you know always comes from the self interest it's all about benefiting this self to allow that to loosen up and have the thinking the direction of thinking gradually towards something that's bigger and then in that the self has been gradually washed away and when the self interest and self preference being gradually washed away the self judgment of what is right or wrong what is benefiting me or wrong, or, or not is gradually washed away as well at the same time and that the involuntary nature is experienced involuntarily it's not like we chase this experience it just comes when those washing away gradually take that's where it takes us and when that is experience that there is just no guilt and there is no mind energy that's been you know put towards that anymore to assess a situation to decide what is best and what is good and consequence of the future and assessing of the past there is just no interest from the mind to go towards any direction there is no interest to think about the past because there is no interest in assessing assessing it there is no interest in going toward the future because there is no interest in anticipating anything. And the cause and effect has been completely lifted up from the form level to think that anything I did in the past is causing the present moment or will cause the future. That has been just completely washed away. So just knowing that this is a huge flow from the beginning of the universe and there is no cause in events and in form in external world that we perceive at all. And in that way the mind just truly relax and just follow the flow and collaborating with what is coming in awareness and you know just being in this constant yes and yielding just yes and yes and that's where the mind starts to be still and the, the joy is experienced. So you can we'll zoom in with with Karen's question about mistakes. So, one example we could use of that would be like the, the, towards the back of the course text. Um, Steve, you have a lot to look forward to as a file because towards the, when you get back towards the very end of the, the 31 chapters, Jesus goes into the rules for decision. And really, it's a convincing job. You need those five chapters, you need all those chapters to start to gear up for where this is going. Because it's like reversing a faulty decision-making mechanism that's been really the ego's decision. It's trying to make an impossible choice to be apart from God and trying to choose between opposites that don't even exist. But it's a big, projected, uh, very intricate trap uh, of, a, of a cosmos. So if we go to rules for decision, what's so great about the rules for decision is, is he says it's, it's easier to have a, a happy day if you follow what I'm going to tell you. Um, and really what that is, is the first two rules for decision is he's basically saying this is where you should put all your focus. Because it's easier to happy day, have a happy day if you could just get one and two. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments. If you really look at the Ten Commandments, those first two, if you could really get those first two, I mean experientially, number one and two, that's why Jesus emphasized them in his Gospels. 
He really didn't emphasize a lot of the Ten Commandments, but he did emphasize the first two. And it's the same with rules for decision. If you can, he says, if you can really get these first two, you, you are on your way to really having a happy day. The first is the side, the kind of day that you want, basically. And the second one is, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. He's like saying, this is simple. The rest, he says, when, when you go off of one and two, it's harder to get back. So it's, it's better to be, you know how they talk about preventive medicine, it's better to, to be health-minded before you find yourself in stage four cancer. It's easier to get back, <laughs> to have a happy day with your thought process at the beginning than be far along on stage four cancer. Not impossible. But it's easier to, to be lined up and stay tuned up and tuned in. So, one of the reparations to, to get back though is, I have no question, I forgot what to decide. This is, this is one of Jesus' techniques to try to get you back to one and two, if you find yourself off the beam. You're, you're upset. I have no question, I forgot what to decide. What's he talking about? I have no question, I forgot what to decide. He said number one, you know, was decide the kind of day that you want. So if he's telling you to get back to that, he's saying, you're questioning something. And you have no business <laughs> questioning something. You forgot, the, you forgot what you should decide. The kind of day that you want. I want a happy day. I want a joyful day. I want a peaceful day. Your mind is so powerful. If you really wanted it, nothing could take you off the beam of that. If you really wanted to be happy, you would be happy. But he's, one of his reparations is, I had no question, I forgot what to decide. One time I was actually in meditation and I just said, give me an example of the question that I'm supposed to let go of, I have no question. Come on, give me an example, just give me a prototype, I mean, that'll help me understand. I have no question, I forgot what to decide, it's a little ethereal. Uh, how do you relate that to human condition, you know, what I'm going through right now? And Jesus said to me, well, here's your question. And it takes many, many, many forms, but basically underneath all the forms, it's just one question that you're asking. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? Oh, you can see how that contradicts the first principle of the 50 miracle principles at the beginning of the book. If he's starting off 50 miracles with number one, whatever he's putting in the number one slot has got to be pretty important. There's no order of difficulty in miracles. When you have a question in your mind of these illusions, which do I prefer, the miracle is not in awareness and no wonder the upset is there. The mind is off onto a, a question that has no answer. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? Remember, the first question that was ever asked, we'll say metaphorically, not in reality, not in heaven, but metaphorically the first question that was ever asked is, what am I? It was a question of identity. And everything else, this big projection, has been an attempt to forget that there was a question asked about identity. Now it's, did you bring home the milk? I told you. <laughs> To get the milk when you came home, I wrote you a note, I, left it, I, left, I sent you a text, and I've got my chocolate syrup here, <laughs> and you know, and, and you know, it's not pretty when you've just got chocolate syrup and you've had your mind set on a good old fashioned hot cocoa with hot syrup, and then, you know, there it is, that's the thing. Now, I'm going to use some other practical examples, because it's a great question to take us down into the rabbit hole really deep. Um, practical example from Francis' life, a parable from Francis' life. Francis, when she was in Beijing, a really good student, really good student, sought after by universities, went to Chicago University eventually. Scholarship? Partial scholarship? Wow. Just came over, all the way over to the United States. And she's a good student. So, how does that apply? Well, let's look at this whole thing of mistakes. Frances came one time and she was going to get her, her driver's license in the state of Utah. Aced the written portion, then you've got to go out, 
and do the driving portion. And on the day of the driving portion, she took one of our vehicles, a Honda CRV, SUV kind of sits up high. And she was in it and she came through various aspects of the driving things, the, the cones, parallel parking. She couldn't see the cones. <laughs> <laughs> because she's, the she's there, the car is up, it's not, it's not your Honda Civic model, it's the Honda CRV, the SUV, and she's, <laughs> so she's a good student, she's aced the written part, and she's, and then, the, she failed, she failed, but because she's a good student, she came back a second time, very prepared, very prepared. <laughs> took my other, a Honda Civic, <laughs> second, a smaller, <laughs> a smaller car, and she, and, and the traffic and the, everything, she just had, it's like, that's what the world would say, learn from your mistakes, learn from your mistakes in the past. <clears throat> well, let's see where this goes. She goes to take the test, and she's going through and making sure that when the stop sign is behind the intersection, that she stops there, at the stop sign, not where she can see the cars. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can see the cars or not. You, if there's a stop sign there, the rules are the rules are the rules. We have a guy out there who's a real stickler <laughs> for the rules. And so she goes through the whole test making sure this time that she passes, learning from her mistakes. What happened? I failed again because <laughs> there was um, a traffic light and turned, green, uh, turned red. So I was slowly preparing to stop, and I didn't realize there was a huge truck just pulling up to, towards me from behind. And the examiner failed me because the truck was too close to me, and I should speed up a little bit to make room for the truck. And I couldn't understand how I was driving forward, and I was <laughs> watching front and stop because it was a red light. And how could that be the reason? But that was the reason. So to I pull forward actually into the intersection because somebody else was so too close, close, too close behind. So after she's failed now the second time, she comes to me and she goes, what is the meaning of this? <laughs> what is the form? Now you see, you see this is an important form? example because she has made mistakes and now she has learned from her mistakes to make sure that she's not in the intersection, she's not violating any rules, and then she sees the mark coming right away and she's like, in the <laughs> how can I fail a test because of what somebody else did? As though we were talking about it afterwards, she said, what is the lesson in this? And, and again, it relates to the rules for decision. I have no question. I forgot what to decide. It was like, you aren't supposed to have a driver's license in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the third time actually. The second time, um, we had a blizzard, so I canceled the exam. And that was the third time. So after three times in a row, that's where the question, we, I picked her up and she got in the car and she's like, hey, I've got a question for you now. <laughs> What's going on <laughs> in Utah? But, but, you see how this relates to what we're talking about. You see how this relates practically to the rules for decision. I have no question. I forgot what to decide. Purpose is the only choice. The only thing that you can truly decide with confidence is your purpose. And that will determine your state of mind. As soon as you forget that it's a dream, as soon as you have a goal in form, getting a driver's license, as soon as you have an objective, you see how opposite these teachings are of forgiveness from practicality. You know, this would seem to be a very impractical conversation. What did I do wrong? Nothing, you're not supposed to have a driver's license. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> because a good student would never, you know, that would be almost like saying, I'm not supposed to pass the exam. Right. But remember the script is written. Yeah, you, you explained this very well for me in, 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 in your other book. 
uh, and I thought, oh, now I see it. That there is no choice in, in what's happening. But there is a, there is a, a you not, you say, but I do not believe in determinism. Do I say that word too? That ter determinism. Determinism. Yeah. You do not believe in that. And then you say, but there's not a choice how to look at it. And wow, that clicked with me. I think, okay, that is what it is. I have no choice in how what happens. I cannot change it. I did all my life my best to change things, and it never happened. I failed every time again and again and again. But I have no choice to look at it, and everything is okay. In, in a way, it, it's fine. It's good. It, it's and yeah, thank you. That was that was great to read that. I think wow. For instance, did I remember soon you asked the Holy Spirit if you should go and get a license. Right? <laughs> Well, that was, uh, I, th I believe that all, all of those events that happen need to happen as well, you know, like I need to go in to get the license, uh, to do the written part of the test and fail the first time, have the blizzard, fail the, the second time, and just, it's all just a big flow of life and it's about how to see it. You know, there is no mistake, there is no, not because I fail the text, it, it wasn't supposed to happen in the first place, no, that's not really the interpretation, but it's like all of it, you know, they're, they're the same, it's just from which perspective to see that. Mm -hmm. And that's good too, because it does take it off the timeline of like, well, did the Holy Spirit have me go there just to fail three times or something? But remember, the Holy Spirit is, is helping the mind unwind from the belief in choices in the world. So whatever it takes, you know, to come to choiceless awareness, that's the Holy Spirit's curriculum, is choiceless awareness. I've even had people in their lives, they'll, they, they say, I can't hear the Holy Spirit, I can't feel the Holy Spirit. They go through a phase where they actually are hearing instructions and guidance and prompts, and then they go through a phase where that stops. And they think immediately something's gone wrong. Sometimes you're just taken into stillness. And even with stillness, the ego goes, oh, now you've done it. <laughs> you've lost, you've, you've ticked the Holy Spirit off and the Holy Spirit has, has quit talking to you. This, this is how the ego works. It always wants to stir up some guilt. Like, oh, you now tick the Holy Spirit off. As if you could tick. If you could make the Holy Spirit angry, you know, the voice of love, the voice for love, you know. It's crazy, but this is how it works. When the whole point is to come into this state of acceptance, of choiceless awareness, of stillness. So, that's the beautiful thing with all of this, is that you see how this fits with, with, you aren't ever making a mistake in form. And then, whenever you seem to have what seems to be a, a wrong-minded choice, it's just a call for love. That's what wrong-minded choice is, it's a call for love. You know, and when you answer that call, you bless yourself, you bless the whole universe. That's really what we're opening. That's a miracle uh, when you answer the call for love. That is, that's another, we could say, definition of a miracle, is answering calls for love. The discernment comes in, is just starting to remember, be reminded, oh, it's just the way that I'm looking at it that's faulty. Help! And then the correction occurs. But as long as you project it out to form and think, I made this mistake, I made that mistake, how could I be so dumb, how could I be so stupid, how many times have I, like in Groundhog Day, you know, he keeps yeah. stepping down yeah. into the same little pothole. Over and over and over until one day he starts and his foot's almost going down there and then he just swirls it around the, <laughs> the hole and goes over it. And that's the last day, if you remember the movie, that Phil puts his foot in that hole. As soon as he has that moment where he goes over it, that's it. He never goes down that hole again. That's, that's a miracle. That's really what this is all about. Because driving isn't special. Driving isn't, like, that's not what that was all about, right? Right, right. It was, it, like, it's not that there was something that you have to think about in regard to the Holy Spirit not wanting you to drive. It's, that's not the right level. 
to think of it, right? Yeah, and even with the symbol of like a driver's license, I mean, we have this thing like uh, universal driver's license. If you have a driver's license in a country like Australia or another country, you can drive. It wasn't a matter of drive or don't drive. In fact, I think we were out recently driving and she goes, she was making her turns and doing this, you know, very just smoothly, miraculously, involuntarily, like, hmm, very, going very easily. And then she turned to me and she said, pretty good for someone who doesn't have a driver's license. <laughs> you see, he's not involved driving it at all. Uh, you, you, you cannot mention it though. I, when I did it with my driver's license, you they said to me, uh, you can, you're not allowed to drive it that fast. <laughs> okay, okay, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I, I think like, um, well, when I first uh, turned into like try to follow the spirit, it seems like the question was, what was the guidance in form at the beginning stage, you know, what was the guidance, but eventually it just like, every decision is about decision of forgiveness, and every decision is about my conclusion, my judgment, things shouldn't be what they are, and sh things could be different, it's just all about that in the moment any, like anymore, you know, it's not about what should I do, what shouldn't I do, it's all about the conclusion that I'm, I'm forming right now can be like go right now. Forgiveness can happen right now. Yeah. And, and then the next step, because when we look at Karen's question about mistakes, it's like if the Holy Spirit is taking you up to this choiceless awareness, and this is peace, choiceless awareness, that acceptance of choiceless awareness, then it must be that, that every guidance, every prompt, is really designed only for one thing, not to have you accomplish anything in form, but to have you experience choiceless awareness, which is where the peace is, That's, that is the peace. So you see how different, then it throws into a whole different realm of practicality. Then choiceless awareness, being the observer, being the witness self, and then ultimately just being, that's where the value is, not in doing it right or wrong as a person. Because ultimately as you go deeper with this into choiceless awareness, you will come to a point of realization. And it can be as quick as you want it. It could be now, it could be this weekend. You don't have to do it over many, many years. You come to an experience that you've never done anything wrong or right. Mm -hmm. That's the release point. You see, that, that end is the pride. But think of all the things that you think you've done right in your linear timeline of life. Those are as much of a block to choiceless awareness as the wrong. And that's the humbleness, that's the stillness, that's the emptiness, that's the wow, <laughs> that's the wow factor of, of literally your innocence. Is that because you've never done anything? Yeah. That was the, the doer, the identification with the doer, which involves obviously personhood, is, is the, the mistaken choice. Not that it was a real one, but just that you thought that you had the power to forget the Christ, to forget that you're the Holy Christ, and to shrink your universal will mm -hmm. that you share with God. Thy will and my will as the Christ are one. We share the same will. To shrink that down to a body, then it's, did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? How many right things did I do? Did, did, do I off, have I done enough right things to offset the wrong things? You see, it's, it's a... So does that go back to the conditioning that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the unconscious conditioning. So, what is your uh, self-inquiry? Like, can you get a, an example of some self-inquiry that you went through as you're unwinding your mind? Well, you, you're just watching your state of mind for everything, like, um, I remember when I would just go to, to discussions or groups or lectures or whatever, and you you hear a stereotype, you know, there's a famous show, um, All in the Family, with Archie Bunker and Edith, and my gosh, if you watch the show, how many judgments come out of Archie's <laughs> mouth <laughs> in, one, in one episode, and Edith's like, over the, she was kind of a contrast experience, Oh, well, aren't you, you know, but there's so many, and, and what I call it, those judgments are example of stereotypical thinking. 
you know. Right. And so you notice if you have any feeling, like you're with somebody, some a party, you're talking to somebody, and you hear all men are, or all women are, that's an example of a stereotypical thought. There are all, all women are not, you know, all women are women. Right. Even that, you have to start to question, <laughs> yeah. that wouldn't be your, probably your best shot at a real thought. <laughs> all women are mm, women. <laughs> all women are women. No, that's not even true. <laughs> you don't got anything else in there. That's not true either. You can see where it's like loosening. So your real thoughts would be those thoughts that you think with God. Uh, or you could say those those inspirations that you receive from the Holy Spirit, even, are filtering through the ego belief system and it's saying, go visit so-and-so, give so-and-so a call. You know, it's using what the ego made, but in a very helpful way, to be a miracle worker. And, and there's no stereotypical thinking in call so-and-so, you know, following instructions and guidance of the Holy Spirit, there's not that. So, you can start to see that most of the minds thinking, when it's in this upside-down, deceived state, we could say most of it is, is faulty. And it, it involves specifics, and involves judgments, and also it involves what, what Francis said, it involves this belief in causation. You know, this should happen. If this happens, then that will happen. For every action, there's a reaction. Even in physics, you know, in science, you could find these spurious, false cause-effect relationships that really don't have any validity at all, and it doesn't help your peace of mind one bit <laughs> to hold on to them. It doesn't matter whether you get a PhD, and you, you now you're really convinced for every action there's a reaction. Would that be like the guy gets too close and I don't fail, and I fail a driver's test? Yeah, that's exactly, that's just another story, another yeah. cause-effect thing, like the guy goes, you know, like, well, Yes, you stopped, but you should have stopped, and every, you did everything right. right. But, behind you, <laughs> there, this guy pulled up too close. You should have moved forward. But you had no control over whatsoever. Exactly. <laughs> Which is still, that's just an opportunity to let go. And that's what she was saying at the beginning, was she was saying that's the joy of letting go of all cause-effect relationships. That's very peaceful. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of assumptions we don't even see that we're making, mm -hmm. and those assumptions and conclusions are judgment. And you know, when, when the Course teaches us to forgive, what are we really forgiving? Are we really just forgiving people or a scenario? We are forgiving our conclusions of the scenario. For example, if um, I made a mistake, I made a mistake, there are so many conclusions at the same time, I'm upset because I made a mistake. There is a, you know, in, in my mind, I'm upset because I made a mistake. Not just I made a mistake, I'm upset because of that. And of how I know what is not a mistake, I know what I want, and I have a choice. All of these assumptions are never questioned. I have a choice in this, and I decided to act this way and that's why I'm upset now. All of these cause and effects are unquestioned assumptions. And then when we say that, do not draw conclusion, is another way to say forgive. But forgiveness word has been taken on different meanings in, in different you know, people's mind. But it seems like do not draw conclusion is more, it's more fresh way of just saying, you know, watch really every single conclusion that you, you form around anything and let them loosen up and let them loosen and say, you know, maybe I'm not really upset because what I did, but I don't know, I'm open, I'm open. And in that openness, there will be new interpretations that come through, new insight will come through. But these closed conclusions and judgments just lock, locked in our, um, Guilt, because the guilt is really underneath all of that is who I, who am I? That is underneath all of these con conclusions and assumptions underneath that, and that is the cause, really, of, yeah. of the guilt. The belief that you can make an identity mistake supersedes the belief that you can, as a person, make mistakes as in your actions and your behaviors. It's this deep sense of wrongness. There's a deep sense of unworthiness. 
not feeling worthy of love, but if God created you as love, and you feel unworthy of love, there must be something unconscious pushed down there that's, that's saying, I'm not who I really am. Even though all the characters have told us, even Popeye, I am that I am and that's all that I am. My gosh, we've had witnesses coming through the cartoons even, <laughs> that we're still whole and, and complete, but, but there's something underneath that's there. So this is really good because it's, it's getting at the, us to question this association between the perception of wrong behaviors and this feeling of upset and go much, much deeper in, a, in, in an inquiry. Um, not only do we have rules for decision at the end of the text, but then you get into the workbook. Oh my gosh, there! <laughs> you can just go into the beginning lessons and you can see Jesus is going right at the heart of it that he talked about in rules for decision. Lesson number five, I am never upset for the reason I think. Let's just use that example of, of three times trying to pass the test and then being failed for some guy pulled in close <laughs> behind you. And if you had a, a charge on that one, you said failed, then we'll say you, you're annoyed. We'll use that word annoyed. Okay, three times now, and now I, I failed the test because, because, you see, that's where the problem is. I'm, but I'm never, wait a minute, I'm never upset for the reason I think. That's number five. I'm upset because I see something that is not there. You see, already Jesus isn't leaving you hanging with number five. I'm never upset for the reason I think. That doesn't do you any good. It's a good start. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. What could that be? Are you hinting? Am I hallucinating or something here? It sounds like a mirage. I see something that's not there. I see only the past. Oh, I'm upset that you're telling me I'm upset because I'm seeing the past. Maybe I think that it's still present. <laughs> and I've forgotten that it's gone. <laughs> that it's over, done, gone, out of there. And gone never to be seen again. Maybe I'm still re reinventing. Maybe I'm still calling forth a witness from the pool of the unconscious past. That is really gone, over and done. This world was over long ago, he says. So, and then he gives you one more step in number eight. My, uh, my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. And then he goes on from there. You know, he's trying to connect and saying, listen, you're hallucinating. You've got these past thoughts. And my thoughts are images I have made. So the world you think you see is coming from the thoughts you think you think. And they're actually identical. You, you've got this mesmerism going on where you're just stuck in the past and you're perceiving the past and that's very upsetting because <laughs> the Holy Instant isn't like this at all. <laughs> and, and as long as you keep thinking it's because of what this one did, that one did, even the person that you have believed you are did things wrong or right, <laughs> you're still got a time mesmerism thing going on, and that's why the workbook is designed to loosen the mind from this. He even says that in the early workbook lessons, we need new time ideas. Because all our old time ideas are very linear, and the ego made up linear time. The ego made up the whole system to keep the mind asleep and guilty. And now we're being shown there's a new way. So, so that's why it helps when we talk about, we have a great question that's a good lead-in, and then we start talking about miracles and experiences that give you a new way of experiencing everything, absolutely everything.